Hey everybody, I'm Emma and I'm here with Chris tonight. Um, today our webinar is on the St. Louis, on St. Louis deeds and vital records and how to use those for your genealogy research. Um, so really quickly, just a couple of pieces of housekeeping. Um, we will do a Q&A at the end. Um, we do ask that we keep it to just questions. So if you have any comments or resources you'd like to share, we are recording this um, and I'll post it on YouTube um, later this week. And there's a great comment section where we can post links and other information that you'd like to share with everybody. Um, so again, we're recording this. I'll email it out later this week. And then please stay muted. We've got about 60 people here live this evening. Wow. Mm -hmm. And really quickly, um, Backlog is the name of my company. We're presenting this, um, this webinar tonight. Yeah. And so we do a lot of things. We do a lot of, you know, like archives work. Um, I'm an archivist. We work with small places to help them bridge the digital divide. We also do a lot of genealogy work, and that's more of the theme of tonight's webinar. Um, we do a lot of brick wall research. So if you've been working on your family tree and you have like one elusive ancestor or line that you can't connect, um, that's kind of where we can come in and help. And then also we've done a lot of cleanup recently of people's trees. So if you've just been clicking those green leaves um, and don't have proof for all of it, we can help you kind of sort through your research or, you know, um, a former family member's research on ancestry. Um, so I'm Emma. Um, I started Backlog in 2021. Um, before that, I worked as a university archivist for five years. And before that, I worked in genealogy and um, local history reference at the St. Louis County Library. Um, and tonight, I'm going to hand it over to Chris. Hi, everybody. Um, is this, I believe, where you want me to take over? Mm -hmm. uh, to make a long story short, uh, I worked at the Recorder of Deeds for three years um, until basically from September of 2020 all the way up to basically about August uh, 2023. And then I struck out on my own, um, but I learned all sorts of really amazing things. I had been using the Recorder of Deeds for historical research for years before I worked there. And I sort of had been my little secret and I found so many different things that helped my own historical research. It's just a treasure trove of important um, documents and historical uh, information that you really can't find anywhere else. It's a repository of information where St. Louisans from the very wealthy to just regular people um, recorded information, uh, particularly uh, property, uh, marriage, uh, birth and death records as well as a whole host of all these other different things um, that you never would have imagined. And we'll kind of go through each of those things one at a time, kind of in a order of, oh, I wouldn't say order of importance, but order of things that I think are what most important things for you to all know about. So maybe we'll go to our next slide, Emil, please. So the Recorded Deeds Archives is located, located in room 129 of City Hall. That's 1200 Market Street. That is its technical address. It's what will come up when you program it into maybe Google Maps. However, the actual entrances into the building are on Tucker Street or on what I call the Clark Street side of the building. Um, there's plenty of different bus routes that you can use to get there. I don't have those all listed. Um, it's the Civic Center Metro Station um, if you take mass transit via Metrolink. Um, if you drive there, uh, to be honest, I would park in the parking garage nowadays with how expensive um, the meters are. Honestly, just parking and paying the the fee for parking in the lot is probably the best. I've always pretty much had a good experience parking in that lot when I was an employee. The entrances are off of Clark and off of 14th Street. And the phone number is 314-622-4546. The hours are 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., Monday through Friday, not on Saturday. All right, next slide, please. And so what's available? Well, there's a lot of stuff available and I'm just gonna kind of go through and I'm gonna talk to you about what is available. First off, there are birth records and the birth records are very interesting. And we'll, get, we'll, we'll talk about what is available. What is available in the archives is from around 1870 up to December 31st, 1909, at which point the state of Missouri took over control of the recording of births and it goes over to a different room and you can talk a little bit more about that 
Same with death records. They start in 1850 and they go to December 31st, 1909. Marriage records, they go all the way from basically the United States taking over control of Louisiana territory all the way up to 1931, at which point the marriage license office takes over uh, control of marriage licenses if you need to get one. And then also deeds. And deeds are basically things like recording the purchase of your property. If you bought a house in the city of St. Louis, a deed was recorded uh, with that transaction. And then we also have adoption records, which are actually recorded as property deeds, if you can believe that, which start, uh, go all the way up till 1917. And we'll talk about each of these in turn. All right. Uh, next, please, Emma. Also available um, are plat maps and surveys from around 1840s to the present day, some colonial records, some copyright registrations that were, um, and also incorporation records, a few DD-214s, and also very important, uh, Washington Park Cemetery disinterment records when Metrolink was built back in the 1990s. And this is also very important, and I'll just touch on this right now, we also have all of the deeds recorded in St. Louis County up until the great divorce. So up until 1876, if you need to get a deed for something that happened in St. Louis County, you have to come to our office in the city. So yes, if you're doing research on a property that had you know existed in St. Louis County going back before then, you sometimes have to go visit Clayton and then you have to come down to St. Louis City as well. Also, and this is this came up one time when I worked there for three years, there was a gentleman who had a piece of property down in Jefferson County that he was doing research on that existed all the way back before the creation of Jefferson County. So they had recorded the deed at the St. Louis City Recorder of Deeds. That's going to be very rare, however. I'm going to stress that it was very cool. And I was very excited that I was able to help him. And, and the reason I was able to help him is that he had what we call the book and page. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the future. So next slide, please, Emma. So let's start with birth records. I'm going to let you know that it's going to be a little disappointing. Birth records were recorded by the city of St. Louis recorder of deeds from 1870 up till 1909. And like I said, December 31st, 1909. I actually checked one time because I wanted to know for sure. It stopped right at, not at, right at December 31st. There are not like, you know, a couple of days into 1910. It's right on December 31st. However, it is very inconsistent. It had nothing to do with social status or income. I personally, I was really interested to see if I could find uh, the birth records of members of the Anheuser and the Bush family and also the Lemps, obviously very wealthy families. I couldn't find any of them. Um, however, people sometimes would request their ancestors' birth record and they openly told us that all oh, these, you know, they were factory workers and I found them. So consequently, it was just up to the mother and father if they decided to do it. Now, it's great for genealogy because if we're lucky, there's all sorts of fascinating information that might be listed, such as the country of origin, where the mother and father were born, the address of where they lived, and interesting things like that. However, I don't want you to get your hopes up. It's going to cost you $15 for us to research and it's non-refundable if even if they don't find anything. Now, if they do find something, you don't have to pay anything more than the $15. You're going to get it. Now, starting in 1910, that is when the state of Missouri took over. And for the first 10 years, it was a complete total mess. Starting in 1920, it became very well done overall. And you'd need to contact the state of Missouri Health Department to deal with birth records after 1920, when they became pretty professionalized, just to put it that way. All right, Emma, next slide, please. Death records, however, once they start in 1850, are excellent. 
they are very well done. They were they were very scientific. They always listed some sort of cause of death. And now a lot of times they use sort of old fashioned names for what the reason that they, the you know, your ancestor or the person that you're researching died of. But you can Google the term and it comes up really quickly. Like, uh, remember there was one, it was like pulmonary pertussis, I think is actually tuberculosis. Don't quote me on that. But the good news is that Google's right your, at your fingertips. You can just Google the name of that mysterious old fashioned name and it comes right up. Why are the records so good? Well, to make a long story short, it's because it has to do with money. You needed to have really good death records because people needed to know if they could then proceed with probate filings and they could then get their inheritance. So starts in 1850. And then for, there's this one period where the records get kind of goofy, where they switched over to just simply reporting what cemeteries had reported to them. Then it goes back to being professional. And the books are gigantic. Just, it, it's really an illustration of just what a massive city St. Louis was at one time. And just like birth records, there is a just a dead stop right at December 31st, 1909, which switches over to the state of Missouri. Again, now just it's random. I don't know why the state of Missouri set this fee. The city of St. Louis didn't do it. $14 for a non-refundable five-year search. There is a very fascinating extra book. It is a book that it includes deaths outside of the city of St. Louis. They actually did that. And that came invaluable for my own personal research because I studied the Lemps a lot. And uh, if you know the Lemps, Frederick Lemp, he died in uh, out in California. And I was very curious to see what they had written down. And in fact, he was actually recorded in the um, deaths outside of St. Louis book. And What's very fascinating, and this is why this is such a great repository, we actually learned that there was a different day of February listed than what had been previously believed. And uh, you can actually just kind of look over there. There was, in fact, someone named Indiana Jones who died in the city of St. Louis at the age of 31, um, sometime back in the 19th century. And to make a long story short, this used to be recorded over at the health department, but the health department was closed and all the records were scooped up by the recorder deeds. So next slide, please. Now. Marriage records. This has always been something done by the city or by the recorder of deeds. And it's very important for you to realize that there are two types. Starts in 1804, right? When the Americans show up and they start recording marriages. There are log books and the log books go, they always were done, but I want you all to realize that you're not going to find an individual marriage license document like you get today if you've been married in the city of St. Louis or anywhere in, in the United States until the 1880s when the two-part marriage license application and marriage license format begins. Before that time, there was merely a series of log books. And the date you actually were married and the date that you were recorded could oftentimes be dramatically distant from each other. And the reason why, and I mentioned right here, sometimes a priest or pastor would wait until he had large numbers of marriages to report. So you might have, you can actually even see in, this, in these log books, you might see 10, 15 marriages by the same priest who might live, you know, five miles from the courthouse in the city of St. Louis, he would take one trip down to the courthouse. So someone might get married on September 2nd, but he or he and she are not recorded until November 1st. So if you request a marriage license from somebody from 1820, you're going to get this kind of goofy little skinny piece of paper mailed back to you, which is when my former colleagues are basically doing a photocopy of that little bit of the marriage log book where they basically photocopied a little piece of paper about this wide and they were going to mail that back to you. That's what you're going to get. After the 1880s, what you're going to get is you're going to get the marriage application, which is very valuable because it will list the addresses of where the bride and groom were living at the time. Incredibly valuable, right? 
then the marriage license then will have the actual legal information on it. It's incredibly important. So it's really valuable actually to request both. The marriage application gets you the, the addresses of where they live. And then the marriage license gets you all of the nitty gritty about who the priest was or the pastor, um, what church they were married in or synagogue they were married in. Maybe they weren't even married at a church. They might've been married at a person's house. And consequently, you get all sorts of information from both. If you just need it for genealogy, each of those are just $3 a piece. If you need a certified copy, they're 15 each. Okay. Um, and again, like I said, up until basically, I think, I don't know, they were arguing about it when I left about what year it would stop for archives and at what point the marriage license office would take over. So give the archives a call and, and ask what year their, their purview is. When I left, they were in the process of really aggressively digitizing all of the marriage licenses so they could just really quickly look it up in their system and have it printed out for you um, very quickly. Um, it's not to the point yet where they, they would email you a PDF or anything like that. This is great. I mean, I've found out so many fascinating things about uh, many different historical figures in St. Louis history, or just simply, I was able to help regular everyday St. Louisans find out about their uh, ancestors' past. All right, next slide. Up. Then we get to the deeds, which take up physically the most space in the recorder deeds storage. And this is very, very important. I'm going to take a very, very long time to explain what these are. Deeds record probably in the day-to-day -day life of your average resident of St. Louis, it records real estate transactions. However, they do so much more than just that. They also recorded loans. Now, what's very important to realize is that in the state of Missouri, you do not have a mortgage. It's called a deed of trust. So if you were to go online and you can actually look at the St. Louis city recorder.org and then click on archives and then you do a search, you can actually look up your own property. If you're a property owner in the city of St. Louis, it goes back. It's supposed to eventually go back to about 1970, but it goes back to about 1980 right now. Um, you can look up your own property. And if you own property, you could see the general warranty deed or the uh, quick claim deed that shows how you acquired the property from the grantor. You're the grantee and that's how you acquired the property. And then the grantor is who sold or gave the property to you. With the deed of trust, you are the grantor and the bank or the lender is the grantee. Does that make sense? So in these books, there are every possible thing you could possibly imagine being sold and transactions and so forth. For researchers, particularly historians, if you are researching a businessman or woman in the city of St. Louis in the 19th century, you must, in my opinion, look at these deeds because they were all giving loans to each other. Banks were not trusted is what I understand because they were not insured. There was no FDIC. Also, if you're doing research on slavery, deeds are oftentimes recorded with the transactions of slaves. That's actually where a lot of the research has been going on. I was contacted from pe by people from around the United States, particularly a lot of religious orders. They're doing a lot of uh, research right now to come to some sort of understanding about how many uh, slaves maybe their religious order might have owned back in before the Civil War. And we've gone and looked and we've actually been able to find deeds that actually record slaves that they bought or sold. Um, yeah, so any kind of property in the 19th century, they actually use deeds and loans between individuals. I have found huge numbers of them. Also very important, this ended in the 1960s, approximately around there. People recorded their last wills and testaments. 
And these are of incredible importance. Now, a lot of these have been digitized by the Missouri Secretary of State, but you can also still find them at the Recorder of Deeds. Uh, Henry Shaw, Adam Lemp, I found. Um, also, people like Peter Lindell. Um, these deeds are like, oh, 100, 200 pages long. If you want to buy a copy of them, it's extremely expensive because uh, to get a copy of a deed, it's $3 for the first page and $2 for each following page. And they do not give out digital copies. So it could be very expensive. Also, you might have remember, I mentioned that plat maps were recorded starting in the 1840s. That's when they were recorded as a separate entity, as a plat map. Plats were recorded inside deeds just like a regular deed before that time. So that's very important to realize. All right, next slide, please, Evan. Wait, can you go back and talk about uh, the city of St. Louis versus the county of St. Louis and uh, deed, looking up deeds? Yeah. Oh, hang, hang on, Leslie, we've got, we're on a timetable, so let's wait for that till the end if we've got room for questions. That, that's, a, that's a great question, and that will we'll definitely answer that. So, the way that the deeds are organized is they're organized first by letter and then by number. So like at least several other major older cities in America, like for example, Cincinnati, I know did it the same way. Books started with the letter A going all the way up to Z. And then they started with A2 all the way up to Z2. And then they considered, they, they continued that uh, lettering and numbering system going all the way up to Z6. Now, just like there's no J Street in Washington, D.C., there's no J book. They skip the letter J. So there's 125 of those lettered books. And then it goes to 126. It does. There's no books 1 through 125. It goes straight to 126. And then those books go all the way up into the 9,000s. And that, go, that takes you all the way up to the 1970s. And then they switched over to a new system. And I'll explain that later on. They're on microfilm, and those can be accessed in room number 129. Now, this is very important to realize, and it's something that is very frustrating and can be very difficult to find the book and page. So there are different indexes on, and we'll explain that in just a second. There's different indices that can allow you to figure out which book and page you need. Because these books, some of them, particularly like book A, A1, is from 1804, it got so beaten up and ragged, they copied it into a new book. But they didn't match up the pages exactly. So page one, well, they got done copying page one onto you know two thirds of their new ledger book. So they went ahead and just started copying page two onto what was still page one of their new ledger book. When they were being nice, they went ahead and wrote page two out in the margin. Then when they were being a little less nice, they wrote page two or just simply two inside of the text of this new copy of a book. So it can be extremely difficult with some of these older books to know what page you're on. And how do you find these? Well, it basically takes practice. And the people who work in 129 are good at finding these pages. Basically, you develop a knack for it. Um, the good news is that most of these books are not like that. It's just some of the older books where they had to recopy them into new ones, where the page numbers up at the top of the book don't match up with what you're actually looking at, if that makes sense. Okay. All right. Next slide, please. So the question is, well, how do you find a how do you find a deed? Like, hey, how do you find, say, uh, when Peter Lindell buys a piece of property from, say, a member of the Chouteau family? Well, the good news is that someone named Colette, who was actually, I believe, a judge in one of the courts in St. Louis before uh, the Civil War, he actually created what was known as Colette's Index. Colette's Index 
is an index by both grantor and grantee who basically wrote down for each person who had recorded a deed in the city of St. Louis from 1804 to about 1851, 1852. And basically what you do is you have the grantor's book and you can see over there on the right, that is from the, you know, from the Z's, you have Alexander Zeebly right there. Well, below it then you have the list of, we'll just say for the sake of example here, that this is the grantor index. Well, then you have him, Alexander Zeebly as the grantor. Below it then, you have all of the list of the grantees. Those are all of the deeds that he recorded that are in the recorder of deeds up until about 1851, 1852. So you know that it's U2, page 426, page 429, page 431. And then down a little bit further, it looks like it's book A, A, Six, I'm not exactly sure, 565, et cetera. So that's how you're able to find it. It is very well done. I tested this and I can tell you that um, I can tell you that it's about 99% accurate. I did with my own research of the lamps, I did find a deed that had not been listed in Colette's index in I think the 1840s. So how do you find deeds? that are not in Colette's index. Well, there are the grantor and grantee indexes that are alphabetical by grantor and grantee. Those take a very, very long time to go through. So what you have to do in their handwritten is you put the microfilm on the reader and you go through and you basically look at each film and you have to go through by each book and you look for who you're looking for. I did that for the lumps up until 1870, if I remember correctly. And you basically, it can take upwards of an hour to go through each book. And more and more books are published every year or are, are, are written because the city got bigger and bigger. Uh, book A, the original book, that actually took several years to fill up because St. Louis was really small back in 1804. But then you get up to the 1860s and they're doing multiple books every year as the city of St. Louis now is in the hundreds of thousands of people. Okay. And so next slide, please. Ellen. Yeah, and so here you go. So direct and indirect indices. This is where it gets confusing. They'll call them direct and indirect. Well, direct is the grantor or the giver. They're the person selling the property or the person who's taking out a, a, a deed of trust, borrowing money. And indirect is the grantee, the person receiving property or the person who is the person who was giving a loan to somebody and is expecting to receive money back on a regular basis from the grantor. If the person, the grantor of the deed of trust defaults, then the grantee receives property or whatever the collateral was in the deed of trust. And like I said, it's organized by letter and year. And yes, it requires exhaustive searching. Okay, next slide, please, Emma. So how do you find the book and page, as we call it, the book and page, say, you know, book R6, page 32, you have to go down to the assessor's office and go to the real estate division. So you walk in the assessor's office and then you go to the left back to this other room that is not immediately reachable from the main hallways of City Hall right there on the main floor. And you basically go and you get the book and page from these, uh, from these basically they're microfiche. And Interco Incorporated, this is actually for one of the uh, shoe, basically for one of the shoe factories. And what do you see listed there? Well, you basically see the Dayton dailies. And the, what's nice and confusing about this is that the Dayton dailies for the assessor's office are different 
than the Dayton dailies for the recorder of deeds. So the Dayton dailies for the assessors are the ones that are handwritten. The ones that are, it's a little hard to see, the ones that are basically written, I think it's LTMO 934 backslash 1083. That's actually the recorder deeds ones. It's really confusing. So to make a long story short, the Dayton Daily, you can take it down to the Recorder of Deeds archives, and then they look it online at this book, and they'll be able to give you the actual book and page of the, the deed. It's very complicated, but they'll be able to help you with it. It's basically the, ask for help at the assessors, and then get that book and page and take it back down to the Recorder of Deeds, and they'll help you through it as well. Okay, next slide, please. Plat maps. Plat maps are of incredible importance. And like I said, they began to be recorded in the 1840s. Much of the city had actually already been platted. The Plat Book 1 has some of the, the oldest parts of the city, mainly inside of Grand. Now, this is very important. There is no Plat Book number 2. It was dumped into Plat Book number 1 at some point in the past. We have no idea why, but it's very confusing. It's just the way it is. Plat books are of subdivisions and additions. And when we say subdivisions, we don't think about it in like the suburban context. We're talking about where someone takes a piece of property and subdivides it into buildable lots. Survey books are where someone does a survey of a piece of property, probably because there was some sort of a question about where exactly the property lines were. But this is where it gets nice and confusing. Sometimes survey books have subdivisions in them, something that theoretically, according to the rules, should have been filed as a plat. We have no idea why they just simply broke the rules sometimes. All we know is that's just the way it is. In 129, there is a gigantic PDF that has all of the names of all of the subdivisions, and it has the book and page that will tell the staff to go to the computer, which plat book to look up, and they'll be able to bring up an image of the, the, the plat book, of the plat, which you see in front. They're incredibly valuable. Take, for example, this one of Lemp's subdivision or addition. It actually shows buildings that were already on the property. So it was incredibly valuable to my research. It showed me where the Lemp's had already been building buildings in the 1840s, when they subdivide their property and to sell it off to, to generate some capital to build additional buildings at their brewery. All right, next slide, please. Shifting a little bit, I also wanted to alert you to the fact that there are colonial records. They're in French. There also are translations of them. There is an index. I think maybe once or twice in the three years that I worked there, someone was able to get something out of them. They are not well documented. Um, the French is very hard to read. I took French in college and it's written kind of very old fashioned French. I want you all to know that they're out there. I want you to, in a perfect world, somebody would you know sit down and really analyze them and figure out what's in them. They tend to be lots of property records and things like that. I just wanted to let you guys know that they're out there. I also want you guys to realize that they're very underutilized and they haven't really been fully documented yet. We don't, don't know why they're in order deeds, to be honest. Next slide, please, Emma. I also wanted to alert you all to copyright registries. This is the location of the famous Budweiser lager beer label which was in the news a couple of years ago. These are very important. These have nothing to do with the US Copyright Office, which is in Washington, DC. Yes, the recorder of deeds recorded copyrights and trademarks all the way up until the early 20th century. The Budweiser logo is very famous. This one was actually copyrighted by Carl Conrad. Carl Conrad was a friend of uh, Adolphus Bush, and 
they actually had a contract that brewed Carl Conrad's Budweiser beer actually for a long time. For eventually what happened is uh, Adolphus Bush just simply bought the beer because Carl Conrad was having money problems. This is the most famous one in there. Um, there's some other somewhat famous ones in there. I, I think what's important to realize is that there is an index um, and they have to go get them out of storage. There's a lot of companies that no longer exist for for you know various products, which are a substantial portion, which are quack medicine. However, I do want you all to realize that they are out there and they might, you never know, might be valuable to your own research. Um, but I do want you to realize that most of them are for companies that went out of business a very long time ago. All right, next slide, please. The incorporation records, however, are something that people requested a lot. These have all been digitized. And if you go down there and the person working is having a hard time remembering how to do it, remind them that it requires a corp prefix when they look it up in Laredo, which is the online uh, software that they use to look up deeds that have been digitized. There is an index. It's on, it's on a, it's in a, oh my gosh, it's so old fashioned. I don't even remember the name of it. A card catalog. You know, you pull out a, then there's a bunch of cards. That is incredibly valuable. I've had people from around the United States call and want a copy of incorporation records. Again, no relationship at all to the U.S. government in Washington, D.C., but rather people would record incorporation records. I found the one for the William J. Lemp Brewing Company. It said exactly how much money they incorporated with in stock, how many, which uh, Lemp family members, how much money they got in stock. It was incredibly valuable. Like I said, people called and they, you know, they asking about just the most esoteric company I'd never heard of. I'd look in the card catalog and there they were. And people were very happy that we found them. So that's also something I want you to keep in mind. Incorporation records, they're pretty darn good in our, our system. Okay, next slide, please. Another thing, and this is something that I always felt like we left the most people unhappy with. There is a small chance that, that your relative might have filed their DD-214, which is their discharge record from the U.S. military. It is not, and this is something to tell people, it was not done automatically. I'm going to repeat that. It was not done automatically. You will talk to people, and I talked to more people on the phone that insisted to me that it was done automatically. It was not done automatically. A person had to physically come down to City Hall. It's done for free. And you can come get a copy for free. All veterans who have recorded it for free can come get a certified copy for free during normal business hours. It's something that the U.S. government has in its possession, but I think you guys all might be familiar with the infamous fire up on Page Boulevard um, when all those records were damaged by first the flames and then by the water. And I think they are on track to maybe preserve and fix all those documents like a century from now, I think, at the rate they're going. So if you are in the military, or if you have a friend or family member who's in the military, this is a service that the city of St. Louis still provides. But just for a sense of perspective, um, we have these giant books that are about this big. Um, the, the pages for like World War II veterans are only like, there's only like 20 pages for World War II veterans. Vietnam, there's like two or three pages, just to give you an idea of how few people have recorded it with us. Um, but just something that I just threw that out there just for the sake of being thorough. Next slide, please, Emma. This is a sad and tragic chapter in St. Louis history, but it's something that is actually very well documented. That is the location of the dis disinterment of burials from what we call Washington Park cemetery north that was when metrolink and the airport expanded and graves were removed to different cemeteries and the index is available online and it's also available in a printed out copy in 129 and i was able when people did come in and inquire um i, I was able to find people's uh, loved ones new location to where they had been 
reinterred after uh, the northern part of Washington Park had been removed. So that's just uh, something else to throw out there if you're helping somebody out with that. Next slide, please, Emma. And then uh, just uh, as we kind of wrap up, and then I'm happy to answer as many questions as you'd like. An example where the recorder of deeds proved critical and really kind of laid the groundwork for my Adam Lemp research were these deeds. Um, this is stuff that I would have never found anywhere else except at the recorder of deeds. Information that proved critical to changing the narrative on Lemp research. And that was a deed where Adam Lemp took out a loan from a, a, a French American widower named Pelagie Boyer. And um, the, the amount of the loan was like, I think just like $300. But what was so critical, um, we always thought from this one newspaper article that he started using his cave in 1845. But here we have written in a deed recorded, what, 183 years ago, 182 years ago, uh, the first mention of the cave. And, and he talks about how it's important to his brewery business. Um, and he talks about how he had gotten it from the city of St. Louis. And that sent me over to the History Museum, who actually has the log book for how the city of St. Louis first rented and then sold property in the St. Louis Commons to uh, private owners such as Adam Lemp. So it might sound boring to some people, but for me to push back the date of the first use of the Lemp cave by four years, that's a really big deal. And it also helped establish that the Lemp brewery was definitely founded on the early side. We've always had dates going from 1840 to 1845 from when it was first started. And now we have this deed saying that he was already using the cave by 1841. So it's of critical importance to uh, my research. The next slide, please, Emma. And then also another example um, critical to my research is another deed. This is fascinating. Um, Adam Lemp, we know this from, again, records and actually another deed that Adam Lemp bought the, uh, the, the Adam Lemp cave property is what we call it for $970, 9.7 acres. And we learned from this deed, again, recorded the recorder deeds office, that um, already by 1843, he had two other business partners, John Keckel and Louis Bach. And we also learned that he actually leased the property out as a farm. And uh, he actually let the farmer drink as much beer as he wanted to out of uh, out of the cave where the beer was being lagered. And we also know that this man, Christopher Charles Hoot, was actually the man responsible for planting the trees that would eventually become part of the beer garden, which would open in the early 1850s. Um, and we also see what might be the first mention of Cherokee Street as well. We're not sure. Um, it might have just been another sort of little path. We're not sure. So I can't tell you, uh, the recorder deeds has been critical to my research. Death records, John Keckel turned up dead and I found a death record for him. Um, I didn't, I couldn't figure out how he died. And then I found the answer in the death records. Um, so I can't, I can't say enough about how important it is to a historian's research or genealogists. At this point, I think maybe I'll open up to questions. Um, I know definitely, I think we have some questions already. We will in just, we, we will oh, in just a yep. second. Okay, you have yeah. a couple of little housekeeping things. Yeah. So, so again, um, Chris, Chris no longer works at um, the Recorder of Deeds, um, but he used to, and that's how he knows all this knowledge and can share it with us. But if you wanna access these records, you have to go down there yourself or contact them. Um, so this is the this is the URL for their website, and that's how you get started on researching these. Yes. Um, yeah. So really quickly, again, Backlog is the name of my company. We put on this webinar tonight. We've also put on several webinars. Um, we have a YouTube channel if you want to check out um, our previous webinars. We did one last December on how to locate your ancestors, which is kind of cool, like how to use... Um, 
city directories and other sources to figure out where everybody lived. We've done a couple on how to read different types of like handwriting and print. Um, Chris did one this summer on how to read different types of German scripts, just how to identify them. And then from there, you can you can kind of figure it out. And we haven't announced it on the website yet, but in November, we are going to do another webinar on using St. Louis um, newspapers for for research. And we'll dig into a couple of the German newspapers at that time. Um, but again, that's not, I don't have a URL, I don't have a URL up for that yet, um, but I will put up next month. And if you go to our website, it's under the upcoming webinars tab. That's where all of our upcoming webinars are listed. Um, and so we can start with Leslie's question about, Leslie, do you want to repeat it? I think it was about kind of the great divorce and why the records are, are different. Um, it wasn't about divorce, but it was about um, uh, recording of deeds uh, in the city versus in the county, um, where to go in each location. Yeah, so um, if you're looking up a deed that was recorded before 1876, you'll need to go to, to the city of St. Louis, even if it's in St. Louis County. And if it's a deed for St. Louis County recorded after 1876, you'll need to go to the Clayton, um, to the Clayton courthouse, the, the Jim K. Roos Center, I think is what it's called. Does that answer your question? I'm sorry, maybe I'm not, I feel like I'm not answering your question. Uh, yeah, I didn't know if there was a specific website for each location. Yes, yes they're it, separate. Yeah, they are. And um, I mean, we, so obviously it's, it's a, sort of a cottage industry. There are many different companies, title companies who uh, who obviously do the research. When you buy a house, obviously there's a, a title company that makes sure that the, the title is clear. And they talked about how, you know, they would come and stop at city of St. Louis and they're like, okay, now we're off to Clayton to do our research in Clayton next. And, you know, they might go out to Troy after that and they head out to uh, Union, Missouri. So yeah, it requires... I mean, they might drive a hundred miles a day or more because they have to stop at all these different courthouses or in our case, city hall. Yeah. It yeah. Does so, require... so this webinar really focused on the St. Louis city records, the county level records are a different beast. So yes, those are separate. Um, we've got a yeah. couple more questions. Um, I think Rebecca, you were next. Thank you. If you want to unmute, we don't have a chat tonight. Oh, uh, really, really can't, quiet. Can't hear you. Not very much, huh? Hmm. Oh, now you can hear you now. Yeah. Oh, you can hear me better? Okay, great. Yes. Thank you. This has been great. I wonder, you said about colonial records, and I have a great, great, great grandfather who is, uh, it says in 1810, he is in the St. Louis district of Missouri. And before that, he was in Louisiana uh, before it was purchased even by the states. But or, would you have any records about him? Well, so 1810 would then be in uh american yeah so well, it, it's american but not missouri missouri is not a state yet well that's true but they already were recording deeds okay There's, yeah that's a yeah that so that's so we've uh i mean we found all sorts of cool stuff for people living in st louis even before missouri was a state um mm -hmm. one of the more interesting things i think don't quote me on this my memory is starting to fade of my time working there I could have sworn somebody actually requested and we found the marriage record of somebody who was on the Lewis and Clark expedition. Wow. <laughs> I, th I think, I think so. Like that's before the creation of the state of right. Missouri. So yeah, don't, don't feel like just because the state of Missouri hadn't been created yet, like 1804, you know, American officials yeah. showed up and they started recording deeds. Now okay. it's really cool though. Um, Lots of the deeds in book A are written in French, but the good news for us is that they force them to also have them uh, written in English. And between my colleague and myself, our rudimentary knowledge of French, the the what was written in English is pretty accurate for what the French was written in. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, people are still, yeah, go ahead. So I can look for, for those records in the cities. Yeah, I mean, right, was he living in St. Louis after 1804 and 1810? 
No, no. He, as far as I know, he doesn't end up in St. Louis. It says in 18 Kenny's in St. Louis district, but I think he's south. Oh, of the well, city. that could be a that could be a very large area. OK, so you yeah. haven't run into something called that before, huh? No, <laughs> no. OK, but doesn't that mean is... that there isn't something. I mean, you, you never know. Mm -hmm. OK, great. Uh, the other, I do have a short question on one of my great aunts died in an accident at the Richelieu, Richelieu Hotel in the city uh, in 1892. And I've seen a death record and it says something about a coroner's inquiry was done. Is that something that the city would have somewhere? Uh, I don't know about coroner's inquiry. You might actually want to contact the coroner's office. Oh, okay. um, I know my friend Stephen Walker has gotten coroner's reports before. Okay. Um, and I think he talked, he contacted the coroner's office. Um, okay. um, if she died in the city of St. Louis in 1892, Yes. I think there's a really good chance that her death, there's a 98% chance her death is recorded in the recorder of deeds records. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, Thanks very much. Yeah. Appreciate it. And I don't have the coroner's office's uh, I can number off the top of my head, but I definitely <laughs> know that Stephen has found coroner's records before. I don't know how, that was back in the 80s. I don't know how cool they are about it nowadays. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. And then we've got Jackie, if you want to unmute and ask your question. Hey, guys. Hey, Jackie. hey, it's good to see you both. This was a great uh, presentation. So thanks to both of you for doing this. Um, it's really helpful. So I have two questions. The first one is, it sounds like if we go down there, we can do some of our own research, but we have to request some of it from the staff. Is that is so, that correct? So the, the deeds are all available for you to look at right there, like the microfilm, the death records and the earth records are down in the basement. So you would have to request that. They had been digitized and I keep checking every so often to see if they've been put up, but they would have to go downstairs to check on those. But you're allowed, like, you know, you kind of like just get a feel for how they feel about letting you look at them yourself. I think they're, they're public record. First of all, that's important to realize that deeds are recorded because the whole idea behind recording them is to make them public record. So anybody can then go down and prove, hey, I made this contract with this person. It's recorded right here in public records, right? That's the whole, the whole purpose of the recorder of deeds is to provide that, um, that authority, that prestige of the fact that now it's public record, right? So you have the right to look at anything there. Um, so you should be able to go down there and, you know, look at deeds. They're, they're, the deeds are right there in 129. Um, so you kind of want, you know, in the Colette's Index, you can look at, it's a, the book is, the bindings are broken, but the pages are all viewable. Like if you're looking, want, interested in looking at something. All right, thank you. And then the other question, more specifically, for the death records, do they list the location um, of the death where the death occurred and or the residence of that person upon their death? Because that's yes. what I need for my um records. yes, they should. Now, obviously, just like anything, um, you know, for example, the, the John Keckle, who I was talking about earlier, you know, he originally came in as a John Doe. So his place of residence was not listed, um, but there's a very high chance. I can't promise you with 100% certainty, but there's a very high probability that their residence at their time of death will be listed. Yes. So somebody that's prominent, like I'm thinking of my buddy, Brian, um, that would probably be recorded since he was a former mayor. Oh, Brian Malanfi? Yeah. When did he die? 1851. Ooh, that's really close. Um, that's like one of the, that's like in the first death book. Um, maybe, I hope. Yeah, I mean, there, it won't hurt to try. Excellent. It definitely, it, the later books, like, so the death books are lettered like A, B, C, D, up to, I think, book L, and then it switches over to numbered books, if I remember correctly, or by date. You, It's worth a try. Go down there and see. And they should actually be able to just look at their giant PDF that they got digitized by the state of Missouri and look for you. Excellent. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. 
That's it's really funny, Jackie, like how you referred to Brian as your buddy. And it's just kind of, it's, it's, it's funny after doing research, like on people, you know, long deceased that they do become familiar after looking at the records for hours and hours. Like well, I'm sure that Chris thinks, or I'm sure that the limps are very familiar to Chris. I'm sure yeah. they feel like family at this point. Yeah, I certainly know a lot about them. I mean, and you know, I mean, the recorder deeds has so much information. I mean, it is just a totally untapped. I probably got 20 to 30 deeds out of the recorder deeds with information that is not available in any other primary source. I mean, these are primary sources. I mean, you just look, you can learn so much. You can figure out when people bought something for the first time. You can prove people wrong about dates because well, well hey, it's right here in this deed that was recorded as a legal document that says, well, the, no, the person bought this property on this date. It's in this deed. You can't claim that they bought it before that because it's right there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, and, and for me, I and this might be helpful for other people, um, the reason I'm curious about that, it seems like a very fine point, but according to what I've seen, he was living in the Missouri Hotel, or no, I'm sorry, he was living in a little off, a little space over um, a, a, a commercial building, so like in a very um, sort of working class environment, but he apparently died in the Missouri Hotel, and I'm trying to figure out if his residence was actually correct at that point or if maybe he was living in the Missouri hotel at that point. So, so, you know, because that it, it tells part of a story that I'm, I'm trying to tease out. So like for a lot of people, these little details may seem kind of irre irrelevant, but you know, when you're trying to figure out where somebody's I, living, it's very important. I can't guarantee that the book A has the place of residence. I know it definitely became commonplace later on in those death books, but it's worth checking out. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Cool. I love questions, so don't don't hesitate if you have something you want to ask or yeah. If you have any questions, feel free to just unmute. We'll give it another another second or two. So, so my company was hired to do research in their quarter of deeds. I think like two years ago now by somebody that didn't want to physically go down there, which is, which is great, but it was just interesting. Like, so Chris helped us through that research. And then we were talking about webinars, what genealogy webinars we could do in St. Louis. And we thought that this one um, would be a really informative one. Cause it can just be like a black box. Like we know they've got a lot of information, but how do we, how do we access it all? So thanks for, thanks for joining us tonight. And again, we're going to do one on St. Louis newspapers, I think the third week of November, and I will post that and send everybody a link to that. But again, we're recording this and I'll email out the recording and the link to our YouTube page later this week. So, Chris. Oh, yeah, yeah. sure. sure. Uh, real quick, from one brewery nerd to another, can you explain a little bit what you're researching? Oh. Uh, yeah, so gonna, I think we're going to have to cut it here oh. for tonight. OK. We're, unless it's a question about the recorder of deeds. Well, I can just answer it like in I five have... seconds. I'm, I'm coming out with a book on uh, Adam Lemp and the Western Brewery. It's basically the history of the Lemp Brewery from its founding up to the year 1870. Expect it out in 2025. Thank you. <laughs> Is that okay? <laughs> Congrats on your book. Well, I, have, a long I have a question. Oh. Yeah, Ann. Go um, ahead. Chris. I have had your email and phone number saved. So who is it who took your place and how do we reach him? Or uh, so I don't yeah. I don't know who really I don't know if anyone really took my place. Um I would if you if you call down there, ask for Katie. She'd be the best person I would say to to reach out to now that I'm not there. Katie. Got it. Katie. That's easy. It's my daughter's name. Oh, great. It's easy to remember then. Right. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. We're at the hour, so we're going to call it. Yep. But have a good night. Thank you. Everyone, thanks for coming.